My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. I will extol you, my God and my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all of your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all of his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. to you guys over the last several weeks and months really about our um, journey toward getting a new facility for the church. We feel like God's called us to do uh, some very specific things with ministry that we, we physically cannot accomplish with the facilities that we have. And so we've been praying to that end. We uh, did a 21-day Daniel fast um, to that end. And, um, you know, what we all want, what I certainly want in my life, not just with this uh, facilities issue but it, with everything when you have something big that you want God to accomplish in your life we, we want him to hit the easy button and drop it in our lap and I've found that that's generally not how he works there are certainly some examples of that the, the big uh, aha moment the big thing that God does a supernatural healing whatever those things certainly happen but but generally that's not how God works he works through process because we need to mature and grow to be prepared for whatever it is he's going to bless us with. So we have to walk through a process. This has proven to be one of those <laughs> those situations, those scenarios for us. And so I've been telling you, I was going to tell you more about what God's been speaking to us, and, and that's part of what's happening today. Um, we don't have a new facility to announce, by the way. I'll just let that off the hook right now. There's no big news there, um, but I have been praying and seeking God. We've been fasting and praying, obviously, about that. We Our first answer uh, in this process to that prayer were the missionaries that we met. We had them come in recently, the RV Maps folks who have offered to come when we do get into another building, whether we're building something new or renovating to, to bring in crews of people to help us for free. Um, that was a big answer to prayer, and so we, we have that as a part of this process. But I'm just going to tell you the story about this next step in the process because I was praying a few weeks ago about all of this and if I'm being honest with you I was quite frustrated with God and uh, that's okay he's he, he can handle it right he wants you to be honest with him and so I was being honest with him I said listen God it's not like I'm asking you for a jet I mean come on you, you put this in my heart first of all you did not me so this is your fault this desire uh, to want to see the local church grow and reach as many people as possible. And the, the way that you've called us to do that, and I've talked to you about it, I won't go through all of it now, but Christian education, uh, adult Sunday school classes, I mean, there, there's all the stuff we've listed out, bringing our kids in under one roof, expanding our children's and youth programs, our outreach to solutions recovery and beyond, all the things that we can't do with our current facilities. I said, Look, you put this in my heart. And by the way, this isn't like... Um, this is going to make my life easier or make me more important, right? It's like it, this isn't a self-gratifying thing. This is going to be more work if, if we're being honest, right? So, God, I'm just praying for what you put in my heart, uh, and I believe it's for the right reasons, the reasons you put there. So what's the deal? Because we're doing everything we can do, and, and I'm seeing no movement. And I'll tell you what, um, he answered the Holy Spirit said to me, okay, so just to be clear, 
You're asking me to significantly increase your facilities. You're asking me to significantly increase your reach in this community. You're asking me to significantly increase your ministries. You're asking me to significantly increase your congregation. You're asking me to significantly increase your influence. But you haven't once asked me to significantly increase your leadership capacity. And boy, was he right, of course, and was I ever convicted. And so after praying through that, I did what I often do, went to the Word and started making phone calls uh, to, to men who are um, pastors, who are further down the road from me, even just some leaders who are just further down the road than me, people I trust and seek counsel from often. Uh, even a couple of folks I'd never met or spoken to before but was recommended I should talk to them. And across the board, uh, a couple of things became clear right away. I was told when asked about the size of our church and the size of our staff and what we're doing, uh, every single person said, you are understaffed, first of all. And if you move into a larger facility in a higher profile location, and you're going to, first of all, you have a significant influx of people overnight, and you will not be prepared. You won't be able to handle it because of the size of your staff right now. There's a rule of thumb. Uh, in ministry, I don't know if it applies in other places, but in ministry that for every 100 congregants, adherents, people in your church, you should have one full-time pastor. Um, Easter Sunday, we just had, we had 536 people that day. The next Sunday, we had 476, which is a little closer to our average. I haven't looked at those stats the last couple of Sundays. The point is, if you say 400 people at this church conservatively, we have three full-time pastors. We should at least be adding one more full-time uh, pastor. And so that became clear. The second thing that became clear is that uh, we need uh, that person to be an executive pastor. Now, uh, Pastor Alex has carried that title for many, many years, and he's done that job, and he's done it well. But the fact is we've loaded Pastor Alex down with about three or four other things that are all full-time jobs for a pastor, including campus pastor at Solutions Recovery, which he's blown up. He's done, an, I mean, that positively. He's done a, an incredible job down there. He isn't physically blown it up. Yeah, no. Um, I have young kids, and they, I learn lingo from them. So anyway, he's doing an incredible job, and um, his heart, he's, he's there. He's still here, obviously. He's going to continue to be here and work with us in the office here, and it's still doing, being a part of what's happening at this campus, but more and more and more transitioning and into his involvement there so that we can do more. Uh, ministry and outreach down there. And you've seen the fruit of that already, right? You've sat in here with, with uh, now probably over 100 uh, people come out of solutions in the last two or three years that we've baptized uh, here, water baptism. I mean, just incredible what's ha what God's doing down there. It's like, like quadrupled the size of our ministry down there since Pastor Alex took it over. But that's left a gap here. And uh, so we started praying about that. Well, that all happened in a couple of days. My time of prayer, the answer from God, me calling men. And within a day of that, I get a phone call from Patrick Hundle. Uh, those of you who don't know them, Patrick and Bethany are our Chi Alpha missionaries that we support at the University of South Carolina. So they're missionaries to the college campus there at the University of South Carolina. Have uh, went there. There was no Chi Alpha ministry at South Carolina, USC. Uh, they went there eight years ago. Started that ministry from scratch has grown. They've ministered now to thousands of college students. Uh, two of the most amazing, capable uh, leaders that we've ever met. And so we developed a relationship with them early on because we began supporting them and just became great friends, started hanging out with them on a personal level and in a ministry capacity as well. And we told Patrick and Bethany a long time ago, probably seven years ago, I don't know if you guys ever transition out of Chi Alpha, please call us because it would be like a dream for us to be able to bring you guys on staff. We just like-minded people, um, incredible people. You're going you're gonna to find that out. And so Patrick called me the day after my prayer time and calling all of these other pastors, and he said, hey, remember that conversation we had a few years ago about us coming there if we ever transition out of Chi Alpha? I said, I do. He said, did you mean that? said, well, yeah. And that started a series of conversations and meetings. 
And uh, to make a long story short, we've uh, come to the place where we've mutually agreed, and it seems right to us in the Holy Spirit to bring Patrick on full-time as our new executive pastor. And so, uh, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, Patrick, there's a process. They have to transition out of Chi Alpha, finish out the school year strong there. Uh, They're going to be moving up here in July, probably early July. Um, Bethany is going to be having their fourth baby girl. Uh, They have three little girls now. They have a fourth one on the way coming in July. So we're going to give them a minute to breathe uh, and let them move up here. And and, uh, July, first half or so of August, give them time to get acclimated. I'm sure they'll be coming to church here, but they won't actually come on staff, uh, you know, paid in the office working here until that kind of mid-August. Uh, but we wanted to let the cat out of the bag and let you know that this is happening. We're excited about it. Uh, we can't wait for them to get here. We're, we're looking at houses with them and just super excited. Um, but I do want to say it's bigger than just the excitement of them being with us and being a part of this, which is awesome. I specifically believe this is an, an integral, um, necessary step before we can move into a larger facility. We have to increase our, our leadership capacity, and we may not be done here. We'll see what God does, uh, but we know that this is the next step in, in our process of him preparing us so that we'll be prepared to handle uh, what happens next. And so one of uh, Patrick's primary responsibilities is going to be um, connecting all of the dots. We have 31 ministry teams here right now 31 team leaders we have department directors and of course we have staff and everybody's doing their thing and doing it well but we're all going in a hundred different directions to get our stuff done and we need somebody looking at the whole picture and and connecting all the dots and pulling all of that together I don't have uh, the time to be able to continually meet with leadership day after day which is what we need someone pulling all of this together and just getting us all going in the same direction because I'm telling you, whenever the day comes that we do move into a larger facility, it's going to be all hands on deck. And we all have to be together. And so Patrick's going to help us do that. These are tremendous leaders, more, uh, even more incredible people, and some of our best friends. We love you so much. Would you help me welcome Patrick Hundley? He's going to come share. Well, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here this morning and to share with you guys. Uh, we're so excited about this next uh, stage in our life. And I just want to say thank you to Pastor Rob, Mary Beth, for uh, we, we were up here a few weeks ago and just our wonderful hospitality uh, and just the board and, you know, the leadership team to uh, offer in this position to us. We're super excited about this opportunity. And, um, You know, Bethany and I, we've, the very first time we spent significant time here at this church was uh, spring break of 2017 when we painted uh, the office building. And, uh, and we just, we just, ever since then, we've been like, man, we love that church. And uh, we, you know, we've always said, like, if we lived in a Greenville area, this would be our church. And I've preached here several times and and I'm like, this would be our church if we lived here. And uh, I think we're going to move up here, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, but Rob and Mary Beth have, have just been wonderful friends and encouragement to us over the years and just uh, just great mentors to us and, and great friends. And, um, and we're just excited. And, and they're wonderful pastors to this church. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm just grateful to be a part of this. And, and every, time, every time we've come here, I just want to say this church has been wonderful to us. And you guys are so loving and welcoming and, and just friendly people, and uh, we feel like we're at home when we're here in this church. So uh, we are just excited about what is to come, to, to join the team and be able to further the mission of this church. Uh, so I just want to show you a picture of my family. Uh, so there's my wife, Bethany. We have three little girls. Uh, Scout is basically they're all about to have a birthday in the next few months, so Scout is about to be seven, Grayson's about to be four, Shiloh is about to be two, and in the uh, latter part of June, we're going to have another little girl, so pray for me. I've got a house full of women, um, and I think we're going to be done after that. 
Um, but, uh, but we have a wonderful little family of a lot of little girls, and it's, it's, it's a handful, and it's a lot of joy. Um, but I just, uh, today I just kind of want to tell you my story for you to be able to get to know me a little bit, um, get to know a little bit about my ministry or, you know, the ministry that the Lord had called me to with Chi Alpha and then how all this is kind of fitting together as we take this position at the church. So um, a little bit about myself. I grew up in the great country of Texas, wonderful land. Uh, It's the land of brisket. It's delicious. It's also the land of the underwhelming Dallas Cowboys. And I'm not a Cowboys fan, so I feel joy saying that. Um, but I, I grew up in, on the coast in Texas in a, in a city called Corpus Christi, Texas. And uh, my family is a hard-working family. Uh, my, dad, my dad ran his own business for many years. He builds, ca- builds cabinets for a living. And uh, just a hard-working family. Um, and and we, we didn't necessarily really grow up in, or like I wasn't born in the church in the sense that I was in a nursery you know, a couple weeks after church, or after I was born, kind of thing. We, we really didn't start going to church until I was in my early, early adolescent years of life, probably like 10 or 11. Um, and we would go to church periodically before that, but it was not really a main part of our life. And uh, around that time, my, my parents just really recognized their need for God. And, and we just, we got, we got involved, my dad got involved in the worship team, and and we, there. My parents are still a part of that church, twenty something years later, um, and uh, and basically that that just that's how we got involved in church. And but I, I will say just something about my life growing up and the way that I, I guess, I, yeah, I don't know. It's just I tended to be very much achievement based. I wanted the people around me to be proud of me and to 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 seem successful and. And, and I totally took that mindset into the church as I went into the church. And so attending church and doing the right things were, were always important to me because I wanted to make my parents proud and, you know, pastors and all that kind of stuff. And, and I, I very much viewed my relationship with Jesus like a scoreboard. As long as my good deeds were outscoring my bad deeds, then, you know, ultimately we're going to win the game and me and God are going to be okay, you know. And maybe you kind of resonate with that, but but that's not the gospel, right? And 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 I and I struggled most of my adolescent years with just this, um, like I had moments where I had experienced the Lord, and um, I went to a, a youth conference, and that was a, a time where I, you know, I, I genuinely believe that I, you know, gave my life to the Lord at a youth conference, and I vividly remember that that moment and. Uh, But yet, through all of that, I still kind of wanted to do what I wanted to do, do what I felt like was right, and and still very much sought the approval of the people around me. And this this is kind of when I headed off to college, and that's when I got involved with Chi Alpha Campus Ministry, which is a a college uh, ministry. Uh, I went to University of Texas in San Antonio, and there was a, a college ministry on that campus that I got involved with. And this is when I really had a person in my life that began to mentor me and to to begin to to disciple me and to show me what it was like to really walk with Jesus, to just spend, you know, just spend adequate time with me uh, to just show me. And and that's when when things began to really change in my life. And and I I began to really... um, want to walk with Jesus, and I began to see the, the relationships, the, the, you know, the, the guys around me, the relationships that they had with Jesus, it was something that I wanted to have, too, because I saw the, the intimacy that they had with the Lord, and, and the way that they spent time with the Lord, it was something that I, I wanted for myself as well, and, um, and that was, and, and really there was, I guess, a, a big, uh, pivotal moment in my freshman year of college I was hanging out with with a guy who was on staff there and he was he was reading out of this book and he was just telling me about uh what what you know what he's been reading 
and, and it was talking about in relationships, we ought to love the things that the, you know, the other people love, and we ought to hate the things that the other people hate, and we were kind of using that as, as we were talking about with our relationship with the Lord, and I'm like, yeah, like, you know, he's telling me all this, but I know inside of myself I was deeply convicted, because I'm like, yeah, like, I love, I love the Lord, and I love the lost, but the things that the Lord hates, the Lord hates sin, right, because sin leads us to death. It leads to death. It leads to destruction in our life, and I knew there were things in my life, there were sins in my life that I was holding on to that I, you know, there's some things that I would scoff at, and I would never do those things, but there were these other things that I was like, you know, I held, held on to these, and that really was a pivotal moment where I, I just, I, I went back to my house that night and just got in my room and just wept to the Lord, and, and it was kind of like a rededication moment to the, you know, for me to the Lord, uh, and just a real pivotal moment in my journey with the Lord, and, and really it was this, you know, over that time, this is when I began to really understand the gospel, and, and it shifted to a more correct way. And it was the gospel, it was, you know, the good news of, that I had heard so many times growing up, but yet it finally clicked. It was the good news of Jesus, it was the good news of who Jesus was, it was the good news of what Jesus had done for me and for you, and it was the knowledge of the grace of God that began to break away at that self-centered drive in my life to, to be liked and to make others proud of my success, because ultimately those are all just selfish um, ambitions. And the gospel uh, really transformed my life, and it changed me. And the thing is, is we all have a story, right? We all have a story for all of those that have, that have encountered the love of Jesus and have submitted our lives to him. We all have a transformative story of the power of the, of the gospel. And and if you're here today and you, you have, have not submitted your life to the Lord and you've not had that trans- I, transformative experience with the gospel, I implore you to submit your life to Jesus. Um, but, but we all have a story, and we all have the ability to share that story with people around us. And, and this, the gospel changed my life, and this ultimately happened because of the Lord, right? The Lord is the only one that can save us and, and give us salv- the free gift of salvation. But it, all, it also came because kind of like a big brother person, a, a mentor, came alongside me to walk, to teach, and to disciple me. And this is, this is what discipleship looks like. Discipleship is apprenticeship to Jesus firstly, and then it's re- sharing out into others. Paul, Paul, he says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's just this mentorship um, model. And, and uh, so I want to just take some time to just talk about the power of discipleship. So Matthew 28, 18 through 20, a very popular uh, verse. It's the Great Commission. It says, all authority in heaven has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I command you, and surely I am with you to the end of the age. So it says, therefore, go and make disciples, right? It's, we are all called to go make disciples, and this, this is not for the pastors, this is not for the missionaries, this is but this is the call for, for all followers of Jesus, that we are to make disciples. And disciples are people, like I, like I just said, are our apprentice, apprentices to Jesus, people that submit themselves to Jesus, that walk with Jesus day in and day out. So how do we do this? How do we go about making disciples? The first thing is that we need to be disciples to Jesus first. Right, that we need to be, if we're not spending time with Jesus, we don't have Jesus to give to others. Right, that we need to, we need to spend time with Jesus and abide with him. John 15, 4 and 6, it says, 
Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So these are Jesus' words, and he's, you know, he's pretty, he cuts to the chase. Right? He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So our first priority is to stay connected to Jesus. And then from there, we are to share what Jesus has been doing in our lives to the people around us. And I think that that is the most natural way that we can share the love of Jesus to the people around us. <clears throat> There's a, a kind of a truism or a maxim that has been pivotal in my life, uh, and it's what God does in you, he wants to do through you. Uh, and to kind of help illustrate this, I want to talk about the Dead Sea. And so the Dead Sea, it's the, it's the lowest point on earth, right? It's about 1,400 feet below sea level, and it's really hot. I've been able to be there, go there uh, before, and it's the saltiest water on earth. I mean, the, the saline content of the water is, is just, I think it's like 10 times saltier than the regular ocean. And it, and it lives up to its name, right, the Dead Sea, because nothing can actually survive in its water. However, the interesting, interesting thing about the Dead Sea is the source of the Dead Sea is fresh water. It's the Jordan River. The Jordan River is what flows into the Dead Sea. So how does fresh water turn into salt water? How does it create this environment? Well, there's two main factors. The first thing is that it's extremely hot. And the other factor is that there is no outlet, that the, the, the Dead Sea is just this big pool of water, and, there, and it's, there's, no, there's no constant flow. To compare this, the Sea of Galilee, which is nor more northern part of Israel, it is 700 feet below sea level, so it's still really below, like, you know, it's several hundred feet below sea level. It's pretty warm there, too. And its inlet, its inlet is also the, Jordan, the headwaters of the Jordan River. But yet it, it has an outflow out of the Jordan River. And it's, it can sustain sea life. So what's the application here? You're like, thanks for the geography lesson. <laughs> but what the Lord is doing in you opens up opportunities to share that with others around you. Being open and willing to share what the Lord is teaching you in your abiding time, being willing to share what the Lord is teaching you in whatever season you're going through, whether it's a, a joyful season or a difficult season or whatever it might be, it opens up opportunities to share what the Lord uh, is doing in your life. And, and when we don't do that, I think it ultimately it, it creates a spot where more growth can't happen in our lives. That if we're not having an outlet it's not creating a, a space that can continue to sustain uh, real growth, kind of like how the Dead Sea is. And the thing is, is when we share these things with others, these things really can minister to the people around us. Right? It shows the Lord's faithfulness. It shows the Lord's goodness. It shows the Lord's steadfastness. Whatever, you know, whatever we're going through, it, it, it can show the character of God to those around us. And it can help those that, it can help those around us to walk closer with Jesus, or it can help those that don't walk with Jesus open up an opportunity for them to give their lives to him. So this, this truism, along many other factors, is really what opened my eyes to a call in ministry. I didn't grow up in a family of ministers, never once in my life thought I would be in ministry. As, as a child, uh, ever since middle school, I, I wanted to be an architect, and ultimately I got a, a degree in construction science and management, and, and I love to build things, and I, that's just what I grew up around. My dad, you know, like I said, builds cabinets for a living, so I just kind of, that's where I thought I was headed in life, in college, but while I was in college, I began to see the transformative power of the gospel in people's lives, being a part of this college ministry, and just the 
the joy and excitement of seeing dead people come to life, right? When we talk about in the gospel that people's lives were transformed by the power of the gospel. It just, it just brought so much joy into my life that I began to wonder, maybe the Lord, maybe I've been thinking I was going to be building buildings, but maybe the Lord's calling me to build the kingdom of God. And, and I took, took the necessary steps and slowly began to go through the process of um, seeing if the Lord was calling me into ministry. And ultimately, uh, that's what I've been doing for the past 12 years of my life. And uh, the past 12 years, we've been uh, working on college campuses uh, with Chi Alpha, spreading the love of Jesus to college students. Uh, we spent four years in Texas on the staff team there, and then we felt like the Lord was calling us to start something new. So what God does in you, he wants to do through you. We had an incredible, thriving ministry um, that we were support staff on in San Antonio, and I, I was like, well, the Lord's doing great things here. He wants to do great things through this ministry and send out people to start start reaching out to other campuses. And And only the Lord would call us to South Carolina because we had really no ties here and um, and we've been here for eight years and it's been an incredible opportunity just to, to do ministry at the University of South Carolina and I've become a uh, pretty decent Gamecock fan and uh, realize I'm coming kind of into enemy's territory <coughs> but but this this mantra of making disciples, like our passion on the college campus is to make disciples that make disciples. And we want to train up leaders to make disciples that will make disciples and make more disciples and make more disciples. And, and that has been the mantra of our calling in ministry and our focus on the college campus. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 is a, a verse that we um, look to a lot, and it says, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So this verse is, this is Paul, right? The Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy. And in this verse alone, we can see four generations of disciples being made. It's, right, Paul is, and the things that you have heard from me, Paul, to you, Timothy, you got to go backwards for that one. Uh, in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men is the third generation who will be able to teach others, others being the fourth generation also. So our focus is that we want to make disciples that make disciples in this, this transgenerational discipleship movement on the college campus. Um, we, we were able to see whole scores of college students give their lives to Jesus. Many students get baptized and just incredible things because we just want to train people to walk deeply with Jesus and to share that love with people around them. And ultimately, we felt like our time with, with Chi Alpha was coming to a close and, and I won't get into or, you know, just and now we have this opportunity to come to Upcountry. And we're just super excited. And the mission statement of the church is making disciples, reaching the lost. I love it. <laughs> I love it. It's simple, and it's laser-focused. And, and I believe that this church is making a huge impact on the Traveler's Rest community. You guys have been growing steadily for, for many years, and I'm going to start using the word we, because we are now a part of this church. So as we make disciples, we will make more disciples, and we will reach the lost in the greater Greenville area and the, tra the Traveler's Rest area. And, and so when the opportunity for us to take this position, it just made sense, Right? With melding our desires and focus of making making disciples and our love for this church and the mission of this church to make disciples, it was like, it's just, yeah, it just made sense. It was, there's probably a great phrase I could say, but I don't have one. Um, but I'm excited about the future of our church and where the Lord is going to be taking us in the future. 
and 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 I'm just excited because we we have this desire to make make disciples and when we do that we're going to reach the lost here but the other way that we reach the lost is with our focus on missions and pastor Rob already spent a lot of time talking about missions but it's something that I care deeply about because I was a missionary for 12 years but and 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 I've been a recipient of y'all's faithful giving for many years and I just want to say thank you for that but you know I was just one of many missionaries that this church supports and through your giving to missions we have the ability to have our hand in the reaching of the lost all over the world that we as a church are supporting uh, boots on the ground missionaries people that have dedicated their whole lives to sh sharing the gospel in places where the gospel does not exist where the church does not exist places that are void of the gospel and by our giving we get to have a hand in helping the gospel reach these places so we may never physically be able to go over there but by our giving we are partakers in what is happening there and that's super incredible and and we can be a part of what the lord is doing across the world by our giving and our prayer support of missionaries and, and missions and this so ultimately this church is advancing the kingdom of god here in the tr area by reaching the people here but we're also reaching the world by our giving and participation with missions and it, it's cool because this church in travelers rest is, is a world-changing church that we are doing incredible things across the globe right here in the little old Travelers Rest, South Carolina. And that's, that's super cool. So uh, I just wanted to encourage you guys in that, um, that this church is doing great things here and abroad, and I'm excited. So we're excited to get up here and to be a part of this wonderful community. Please be praying for us that the Lord would provide a house for us. And uh, I'm just looking forward to coming alongside and joining this incredible pastoral staff team and, and the team here at the church and to continue to fulfill the vision and the mission of this church. Um, so I love you guys, and I'm looking forward to getting to know you more uh, today at the, at the indoor picnic. Uh, and... Uh, so I just want to take a moment to just pray, and then I don't know what's after, but...